want to get into something a little new. Radio communications. I don't know, it sounds a little boring. It sounds like, you know, radio communications, two guys on their CB radio, you know, fat, you know, you know uh, trucker guys talking about their monkey wrench. But really, we use radio communications more than you think. I mean, cell phones, cordless phones, uh, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, satellite communication for your satellite TV and your internet provider and, and cable TV. Wireless technology is all around us, and why shouldn't we explore it? I mean, there's a whole radio world out there that most people don't even know about because they were never, never made, the, the information was never made available. Now, um, I want to explain FRS radio. FRS, or Family Radio Services, I do believe in Europe it's called uh, PMR, Portable, Portable Mobile Radio, I could be wrong. Um, usually the radios can range from relatively cheap to really expensive. Now, uh, here's two radios I've got, okay? This is one's made by Motorola, and this is Maxis, uh, I don't know who makes it, uh, it's some no-name brand. This cost me about $50, this cost about $8. The difference between the two, this one has customizable, like, you know, call tones and Roger beeps, and this one doesn't. When it comes to FRS and, and, uh, and uh, the PRS, or whatever it's called in Europe, I forget the name, um, the output power is always the same. Uh, it's limited. So it doesn't matter how much you pay for a radio, you're always going to have the same output power. You just pay for more features. It's really not important. Now, I've got this radio over here. I think this one cost me, like, $12. It came in a pack of two, and it was, like, $25, including tax. Now... With an FRS radio, you can obviously communicate to other FRS radio users, but there are um, people we call jammers. And what a jammer does is kind of like an IRC noob or, you know, the, all they do is flame wars and denial of service attacks. All these jammers do is get on the radio, hold down the transmit button for hours at a time, like blasting music or cursing and screaming. Now, that's not all too fun. But, you know, when you finally do get two FRS radios, you know, why shouldn't you do more with it than what it's intended to? So I want to show you something called Slow Scan TV. Slow Scan TV, you basically, you use a computer, um, and you modulate um, an image. You basically take that image, you convert it into a, a modulated sound, carry it through the air to your other radio. So if the internet is down, whatever reason, or you have no power, or you have no way of communicating, and you need to send a picture, or a map, or an image to someone, FRS radio, laptop. It's all you really need. The, the setup is quite simple, okay? All you really need is an FRS radio and some kind of computer. Um, Windows, Mac, Linux, and there's slow scan TV applications for pretty much every operating system. This radio has a headphone jack and a microphone jack. Unfortunately, I lost the adapter for the microphone jack, so I can't show it to you. But um, basically, this is just plugged straight into my computer. No. No fuss, no muss, no real brain work here. Just the, the speaker is plugged into the microphone. So whatever this ra radio receives, it'll, it'll spit into the computer and the computer will process. And the speakers will plug into the microphone. So when the computer spits something out into the microphone, it'll transmit. That's another thing about FRS radios. A lot of the models, when you plug a headphone jack into the microphone, it'll automatically start transmitting. So if you have a problem with your radio constantly transmitting, you might want to think about putting a switch in line with the, um, the transmit, like a toggle or a push-button switch. Now, we'll go to the software side real quick, and I'll show you the quick setup of a slow-scan TV application. Over here, we have MMSS TV. Um, a really great free, free application. It looks kind of complicated. It looks kind of, you know, like there's a lot to it, but really, install it. Um, you'll have to set up a call sign because this is an amateur radio application. However, FRS uh, doesn't require call sign. Make something up. This over here is your spectrum equalizer. This is the actual what's coming into your audio right now. Now, if you want to send a picture, you go to your transmit. Now, of course, they have little templates and stuff that you can use. This one's just the default. You just right click. You know, you can paste an image or load it from a file. You know, play around with the options. But save that for another day. This is the receive window. You really just have to leave the receive mode to auto. The different modes are pretty much protocol. The further down the line you go, the more bandwidth you need. The more bandwidth you need, the longer the transmission is going to take, but the better quality of the picture. We're going to stick with Robot 36 for, the, for time's sake. Um, the one thing I suggest you really do is you go into the options, and you see the auto resync and auto slant. Make, those, make sure those are checked, because it'll automatically adjust the picture if it goes out of sync or out of slant so you don't have to deal with it. If it does go out of sync, 
you'll actually get a sync profile, a grayscale sync profile here. You just hit this little button, it'll actually turn, it'll turn uh, like to a yellow smiley face. Just click that and it'll fix your picture. Okay, now I've got Bunny on the other end of the radio in my lab all set up for a transmission, so I'm going to tell her to transmit us a picture. Okay, honey bunny, can you please uh, do a slow scan TV transmission? You got it, Bubby. And notice how it instantly corrected itself when it got slanted, which is good. Now, while this is receiving, you know, you can, you can see the image coming by. It's not the best quality. It doesn't look the greatest, but again, I mean, it's a little bit better than a fax, or actually sometimes they get a lot better than a fax, and if you're in an emergency situation and you really need to go and like, get a map or a picture of someone, and you don't have a camera phone, you don't have, you know, anything except just your computer and uh, an FRS radio, there you go. This is also another way of actually sending candid images and messages through through radio. I mean, it's, it's pretty sly, it's pretty sneaky, and it's not very hard to set up. All you really need to do is pretty much hold the radio up to, up to the speakers to your computer, and that's it. You can transmit. And to receive, you just hold the microphone up to the speaker. I mean, you really don't need an elaborate setup. It's pretty simple, and it can be pretty fun. I mean, a couple of uh, friends and I in the neighborhood will, always, will instead of um, you know, talking, we'll just go and send pictures and images to each other because, hey, it's just fun. This is one of the many, many, many things I plan on covering with uh, radio communications and amateur radio. Hopefully this sparked your interest, and if you have any questions or comments, check the show notes, check the forums, check IRC. I'll definitely be linking to the software, as well as another piece of software which I'm not going to cover today for time's sake called Radio TTY, which is much like the TTY terminals for the telephone system, but for radio. Hooks up in the same way, works in the same way, just as easy to use. So, have, have good luck and have fun. Today I'm going to show you how to install skins on your Motorola cell phone. I'm using a Motorola V635 today, but I've done this on a V3 Razor before and it's worked the same, and I think it's the same for just about every Motorola cell phone out there. Um, the first thing you need to do when doing anything to your cell phone is back it up because it, you could damage it, you could fuck it up, it may never run again. Also, get accidental insurance on it before you fuck with anything. It's only like five, six bucks a month, and if you do all your hacking on your cell phone within, the, within that month, it's six dollars, and you're guaranteed to not be without a cell phone. Um, make sure the battery is completely charged, because if, if you're flashing or flexing the phone and the battery happens to die halfway through it, you're screwed. Your phone is bricked. There's no repairing it. You better hope that you got that accidental insurance I warned you about. Um, I'd use a, make sure you sit the phone on a flat surface because that, that doesn't move because Motorola uses two different kinds of cables. So one is the US, mini USB cable. The other is some pri proprietary piece of crap that any time it's moved the slightest bit it disconnects and that will fuck up your flex or flash or whatever you're doing. Now that that's done let's explain the programs we'll need. You'll need P2K tools, PST phone programmer, and some sort of skin. We'll probably have a list of different places you can download skins from in the show notes. Start a PST programmer and eventually it'll establish a connection with the phone. Then just minimize that and start P2K tools. Make sure it's in uh, P2K mode. Go to the file manager and hit refresh. Expand the A drive, expand mobile, and go down to skins. Create a new folder. And now you need to refresh. Open the new folder. Now open the, the directory of the skin you downloaded. Copy the skins into the new folder.
Now that they're copied, go back to the pictures folder. Copy all the pictures into the pictures folder. Now go to the system folder. And copy whatever files are in there to the system folder on the phone. Now all you need to do is restart the phone. Now we just need to reboot the phone. And hope that it starts back up. There it goes. Hopefully you can see this. Bring up the menu. Go down to settings. Personalize. And then skin. There's a new skin we just made right there easy enough. So we've done a lot of poking around inside the NES. Now we understand how to search for memory addresses and we understand a little bit about how it's formatted and how it's put together. But that's just the data. I mean there's a lot more to a game like the graphics and the sound. What I want to explain now is level editing. I take absolutely no credit for discovering any of this work or even the cheat code stuff. All I'm really doing is explaining to you guys stuff that I already do that I picked up from other people's work and part of what I like to consider a community so there's a whole community out there of people who disassemble uh, NES games and then completely redo them they, they redo the sounds, they redo the graphics they redo the levels and you have a whole new game so basically you're using the original programming kinda like as a graphics engine or, or, a, or a code engine and then just kinda reworking everything um, the number one game that I think has been hacked absolutely the most has to be Super Mario Bros. 3. If you saw the first segment on, on my NES lobotomizing, I explained that there are levels, entire levels and graphics and sprites and whatnot in the game Super Mario Bros. 3 for NES that were completely unused and they were unfinished, un, uh, completely unaccessible unless you went into the game and you, you fiddled with its insides until you, know, you got it to work. Um, there's a lot of tools that you can use for reverse engineering or, or decompiling and disassembling games to get the graphics out of it. There's a lot of stuff you can use to go and, and rework it. Unfortunately, a lot of it's in DOS and I can't do screen captures of DOS or a Linux command window. So I'm just going to have to explain it to you and you're going to have to take me on good faith. So we're going to go to the computer side and I'll show you a couple of great websites that will get you started. If you've ever played a game like SimCity or... or uh, Command and Conquer, you really should be able to get these level editors done, you know, pretty easily. I mean, it's not that hard. It's pretty much point and click. You do have to have a little bit of understanding of how the game's put together when it comes to entry points and exit points, but if you've been poking around the memory addresses and you have an understanding about that, that's great. Depending on how far you want to go into editing, I mean, you could do stupid little things like, you know, take Mario's hat off or, you know, have Phallus running around instead of Goombas. Or you can go as far as completely reprogramming how the entire game works, making an entire new world, making entire new levels, making an entire new storyline. So, go to the computer side and we'll do a little bit of explaining. The MushroomKingdom.net has to be the place for information about hacking Super Mario Bros. 3. Now, there were a couple of other forums and boards, but they have seemed to go down, so I'm not even going to bother mentioning them. On this website, they mention the lost levels, saying, you know, within the game, there are lost enemies and lost sprites, whole levels that have been unfinished, which I'll show you a little bit later. 
Um, they also give you a lot of information about how the game goes together, like here's some unused sprites for bonus games and translations. They even tell you um, how to get into um, debug menus using Game Genie codes, which is, you know, if you're, of course, if, if you're watching this, you're familiar with poking around memory addresses. And they, they give you a lot of great information. If you're really interested in this, I'd highly recommend uh, looking over their website. Um, they've got a lot of good stuff, but basically um, they use uh, tools that are freely available on the internet, like level editors, which I've ex I'd like to explain. Zofar's domain has to be one of the best repositories for uh, emulation, emulators, tools, utilities, whole nine yards. If you go in their NES section, they have level editors, and they've got a lot. I mean, they've really got a lot of level editors. If a game was relatively popular, there's a level editor for it. I mean, they got Final Fantasy, Legend of Zelda, Super Mario Brothers, uh, Mega Man series, you know, they've got a lot. And these are just some of the things that you could use just as level editors. I mean, you can go in there and use some emulators directly, but like I said, I, they, those run in a DOS environment and I can't do screen captures, so figure it out. Once you have a level editor, you have to have an understanding of how the game works. And if you've been lobotomizing your NES and poking around memory addresses, you should have a little bit of an understanding. However, Google searches never killed anyone, so I'd highly suggest that. You can go to romhacking.net, they have a search engine for like level editors and utilities and whatnot, but I prefer Zofar's domain in Google. There are nothing wrong with these guys, it's just I, I feel they're just a little, little half-assed, but eh, it works. Lincolnsoft has Mario Improvement 3, which has to be the leading tool for level editors when it comes to Mario Bros. 3. Um, I'd love to show you how it works, but it runs in DOS. Don't blame me. Sorry. I would highly suggest if you want to get into level editing from Super Mario Bros. 3, this is the tool to use. I've used it. It's, it's great. It, it works beautifully. Matter of fact, this was the tool used by the Mushroom Kingdom, the website, not the actual Mushroom Kingdom in the game. Duh. Anyway, this was the tool used by the Mushroom Kingdom website and people on there to reverse engineer the actual game's graphics and find their, what they call the lost levels and a whole bunch of hidden sprites and, and graphics. Okay, as I promised, I'd show you guys how to access the lost levels. Now, please, like I've said, I take absolutely no credit for this work whatsoever. I'm just following the footsteps of people greater than myself because I have absolutely no idea how hard it was to do this. I don't think I could ever do it myself. Okay, you're obviously going to need an emulator, and my emulator for PC of choice is NES 10. It's a great little emulator, unfortunately it never made it out of beta because the project leaders uh, moved on to a better NES emulator, but really I don't think it gets any better than this. It supports everything for NES except light gun, it's easy to use, it's stable, and the minimum requirements is a 200 MHz or 266 MHz MMX CPU, so you can run it on damned near anything as long as you're running in a Win32 environment. You're also going to need an IPS patcher. Um, you might be familiar with IP IPS patches. Basically, someone will create an IPS file, which will apply certain pokes and prods and adjustments to a specific file. Um, so basically, an IPS file will make changes to a specific file in a specific way. No matter the platform, no matter the operating system, no matter what you're running, it will make those changes to that file, specifically how, is it, how it was designed. And of course, you're going to need the Super Mario Bros. Uh, 3 Lost Levels IPS patch, which you can get from the, from, the Mushroom, uh, from the Mushroom Kingdom, sorry. And you're going to need an original Super Mario Bros. 3 ROM. I'm not telling you where to get that. Use Google. Okay, so we're going to load up the Super Mario Bros. 3 just to verify that, you know, here's Super Mario Bros. 3. Okay. And apparently Cam Studio has taken a lot of load off my uh, CPU. Okay, it's running slow because my computer's working hard because I'm doing the recording. But here, Super Mario Brothers 3. Whoop de doo. Okay, go and Google IPS Win if you have Windows. Um, it's a Windows based IPS patcher. Duh. File to patch. It's pretty simple. We want to patch Super Mario Brothers 3 with the Super Mario Brothers 3 Lost Levels IPS. I think it's a good idea to make a backup copy. I like to log because I'd like to know what's going on. We patch it. 
it's done. Now our Super Mario Brothers 3 has the adjustments that the Super Mario Brothers 3 Lost Levels IPS patch will do. Now, I'm sorry, this is going to run like crap, but deal with it. See, and notice how the game is completely different because of that IPS patch. Okay, well, there you go, the lost level. You can go and get the IPS patch from the Mushroom Kingdom's website. Um, you can use Google to figure out where to get the Super Mario Bros. 3 ROM file. You put the two together, and you can access the lost levels. Or you can use um, Mario Improvement 3 to go and access the lost levels your damn self and completely rework the graphics in the game however you see fit. I'd also like to state that the Mushroom Kingdom website also has um, reworked games. Um, you can actually use Google to find completely new versions of Super Mario Bros. 3, Super Mario Bros. 2, Super Mario Bros. 1, Legend of Zelda, Mega Man. A whole bunch of great games that people have changed the graphics around, changed the enemies around, created whole new storylines, which are actually pretty interesting, just because they can. Okay, today I want to tell everybody about a security hole that I feel needs to be addressed. A lot of people could be affected and not even know. VNC, or Virtual Network Computer, is a way of remotely controlling a computer either over the internet or through a LAN, uh, kind of like Windows Remote Desktop Connection. And a lot of people don't know that their ISP is sometimes installed on their computer. Um, Real VNC version 4.1.1 and earlier allows an attacker to gain remote access without even having a username or password. Um, this works because of a buffer overflow and how the password is handled. The attack can, has become extremely popular recently. There's been scripts that's made it fucking dumb people can, can figure it out and get into your computer. So today we're going to try to explain exactly how that works and possibly how you can protect yourself. VNC or virtual network computer is a way to remotely control a machine over a network or the internet. This is a great tech support tool, but it can also be used as a weapon. Since it's a great tech support tool, a lot of ISPs installed on their customers' computers, sometimes without even letting them know. Some people just install it to get files from their home or office PC. There was a flaw that was discovered in Real VNC version 4.1.1 and earlier that allows the attacker to gain remote access without even having to enter a password. This works because of a buffer overflow in how the password is handled. The attack is well known and has been made point and click easy. Because so many people use real, MV real VNC, the simplicity of the attack and how devastating it can be on the victim, I think, it th I think the public should know. The first thing is that has everyone's IPs, so forget that I even mentioned this. On this machine I set up an exploitable version of real VNC. I'll go in and set the password to something like, uh, let's say, hey would you blow me. Now that that's set, in, set up, let's log in using the client. Type in the IP, the port, and let's leave the password blank. And look, it won't let us log in. We'll try again using the real password and type in, hey, would you blow me? And look, we're in. Metasploit Framework has the exploit we need. There's another tool that can be used for some serious damage if in the wrong hands, so we're not going to explain it. Once you're set up, all you need to do is launch your VNC client. Point it to the right IP and port, and now we're in. Now I have full control over this machine as if I were sitting right in front of it jizzing all over their keyboard. There's also a VNC viewer that has the exploit built in. This can't get any easier. Don't ask where to get it, we won't tell you. As you can see, if your system is, has a vulnerable version of real VNC on it, you can be in big trouble. This attack is serious. Uh, some of the best ways to protect yourself would be keep your VNC server up to date. Um, I, whenever I use a VNC server, I don't use a default ports because most of the people that are scanning will just scan for the default port range or possibly use software that actually works right. It's kind of hard to find nowadays, but give it a shot. Anyway, 
If your computer gets fucked up, don't say we didn't warn you. I was asked to do a quick little segment about infrared vision. Um, this is actually covered elsewhere on the internet. Um, I haven't seen the articles myself, but I've been told about them. Basically, this is just a modification you can do to any CCD camera so it can pick up inf the infrared spectrum. CCD stands for Charged Coupled Device. Um, you might be saying, where am I going to get a CCD camera? Well, a CCD is in every single digital camera, so it doesn't matter a webcam. This over here is actually um, one of my X10 cameras that I've decided to rip apart because I wanted the 2.4 gigahertz transmitter, which we won't get into today. Um, don't worry about the awkward wiring. Just forget that exists. This camera's actually been pre-hacked. Eh. All you really have to do is get a digital camera of any kind, a webcam. Um, if you're familiar with the Dakota digital disposable cameras, the disposable digital cameras, even your camera phone, every single camera that's digital or electric is a CCD. Modding it's pretty simple. All you really do is you open the camera up and you get into the, the creamy insides. And there's going to be a lens unit that you have to take apart. You have to be kind of careful so you don't damage it. Okay. Once you get inside, there's going to be a small piece of filtered glass that's going to allow you to, uh, once you remove it, it's going to allow you to um, uh, see the infrared spectrum. Okay. Here is the actual unit I'm talking about. What you have to do is there's small screws on it. When you pull it out, there's going to be a small little piece of polarized glass. I'll put a screenshot up because this is, well one, it's already been removed from this one, and two, the lighting in here sucks so much you're not going to be able to see it if it was in there. Once you remove it, um, all it does, all that little piece of glass does is filter out the infrared spectrum, so it blocks out infrared. So once you remove it, you re-enable the natural abilities of that CCD camera, which can see infrared. Now, if you want only infrared vision, you don't want standard standard vision as well because your colors are going to be all screwed up. You're going to be, everything's going to be washed out and green and orange and you're not going to have blues anymore. If you want just infrared vision, go get an old um, negative from Photograph. Like, you know, when you get your actual, like, photos developed, it comes with um, a negative. Take a piece of negative and replace that inside here. And what it does is it'll block out all the ambient light, but it still allows in infrared. Now, I'm going to go and piece this thing together. Keep in mind, all you do is you take your camera apart, remove this unit. There's usually two, three, or four little screws holding it on. You pull it out, and then you just pop off the, the polarized filter. Then put everything back together. And this is what I want to explain, is hooking everything up. So I'm going to go and put this camera back together, and I'll get into how to actually hook everything up. All right, here's some of the junk that I use. Yeah. Game Boy SP, what I have is a cartridge that allows me to have video inputs. Well, it's not the best screen in the world, but we need something small and portable, or what I would consider a, uh, uh, an LCD or a, a display beige box, really good for uh, when you find those uh, video surveillance patch boxes with a set of, uh, well, the equivalent of a beige box clip hooked into, uh, hooked into your video. You can actually tap into video feeds. Also, also over here I have a... Um, a portable screen for the GameCube. You can also get one for the Xbox or PlayStation 1. They're essentially all the same same screen. Got some battery packs and hookup cables. Some quick side notes. Ground in most of these devices over here are tied together, which means the ground for the video, audio, and power are all the same wire. So when you go and take your camera apart, if you only notice one, one black wire is ground, then it's most likely going to be the ground for audio and the ground for video as well. Also said for the screen, also said for, well, almost all electronics nowadays. When you power your camera, make sure you test the voltage of the original power source. The original power source to this thing is 12 volts. However, the camera itself only requires no more than 9. So, it can actually run off of 7.5. That's also said for this screen. This screen does not like to be run off of anything greater than 8.5 volts. Um, it's normally 7.5, but you can draw, I think, down to 6.8. I'm not sure. I forget. Uh, the Game Boy, really, it's just plug and play. You know, really can't mess it up. I've got an awkward cabling system here because I like modular design. I like to use my Game Boy screen, my, my PlayStation 1 screen, and my battery packs for an array of projects. So, bear with me. Okay. 
So I have an adapter here from my modded screen which allows video input and power input. So all I'm going to do is I'm going to power up my screen. Okay. Here we go. Screen's powered up. Okay. Using this separate battery, we're going to power up the screen. Uh, sorry, the, the camera. Power up the camera. And then using a standard hookup cable, I'm going to plug this into my screen. And there we go. Say hello to the camera. Now there's a little knob here that you can use to focus. There we go. Now if you notice, the colors are all kind of weird. Like I said, you know, your reds and your blues and your greens are all going to be washed away because you're now infrared. Now I'm going to go and grab my remote control that I use for my camera. See? Now you're picking up infrared clear as day. Well, I really should hit the lights in the room and turn off everything and show you. Oh, I broke something. There we go. We all remember this. This is my uh, all-in-one remote control for the house. I used this in my JP1 as well. All right, let's... What button? Mute. Mute. There it is. Mute. All right. There we go. See how we can now see the... Come on, you... Work. Well, you get the point with that one. Let me go and fire up my lights again, because... Pretty sure you can't see the damn thing. There. I'll show you on the Game Boy. Hopefully you get a little bit better of a picture. Let's see. Video, video, video. There we go. Video. There we go. Video. We can make a craptastic night vision system using a Game Boy and a modded camera. For the sake of perspective and clarity, let me give you an alternate angle of what just went on here, okay? If you can't get yourself a cartridge for your Game Boy Advance as a screen, okay, that's cool. They're kind of hard to get. If you can't go and get yourself a game screen, like a PlayStation 1, or this is actually made by Verge Incorporated, if you can't get yourself one of these, oh, okay, you know, they are kind of hard to get. Um, if you're really lucky, you can get yourself a, of a composite VR glasses, which this, coupled with this, coupled with a whole bunch of infrared LEDs, you get yourself some ghetto-tastic night vision. But pretty much anywhere you go, you can get yourself a 5-inch black and white CRT for about $20 to $25. I know it's big, it's bulky, it's cumbersome, but it's a screen, it's cheap, they're kind of easy to get, they're reliable, however they're power hogs. This thing usually takes up about an amp and a half of power, so eh, but I hope you got a wet cell around. Okay, just for a little bit more clarity on batteries, okay, this camera can take up to uh, 12 volts, but it really wants 7.5. This is a 7.5 volt remote control car battery. These are uh, NICAD batteries, as are these. 9.6 volts, 1,600 milliamps. 7.5 volts, 3,300 milliamps. The milliamps, or the amperage, is how long it's going to last divided by, or multiplied, whatever, by how much current draw. Okay, example, if this screen takes up one amp, this battery will, will power it for 3.3 hours. You got 3.3 amps, one amp screen, do the math. Okay, uh, when it comes to amperage, you can never have too much when it comes to, when it comes to the um, rechargeable batteries. Um, this, uh, the reason I don't use this battery anymore, because I actually designed a voltage regulator for the screen with using this battery. This screen, in fact, is a, almost a one amp screen, so this, thing, this battery only powers it for maybe about one hour, 45 minutes. That, coupled with the, uh, or attached to the camera, and attached to an infrared LED array, my night vision didn't last me too long. As for the night vision, or the infrared vision, infrared LEDs are usually low power. All the stuff you get in, like, infrared remote controls, like so, are relatively low power. What you can do is you can get a whole bunch of them, line them up in series, and then power them with, a, with one of these batteries, and use a, um, a magnifying lens. Standard, you know, you can go and get one for like a dollar and a half at a local thrift store, just a magnifying lens, and you can focus that beam of light 
so it covers directly in front of you instead of like all around you because you don't need to see behind you you don't need to see 180 degrees to the left 180 degrees to the right because the camera only usually has about a, uh, anywhere from 60 to 120 degrees on a viewing angle which means it can't see stuff that's over here and over here the viewing angle goes out like a cone like that so there's no point to uh, illuminate behind you and on the sides of you with infrared so using using a magnifying lens you can focus that beam to uh, spotlight a specific area that is tuned to the viewing angle of your camera I mean it sounds really complicated but it's not grab a camera pop it open when you are opening up electronics like the screens and the cameras if you can't find screws oftentimes they're hidden under labels or they might have pop tabs try not to use a metal screwdriver to pry it open because you put Mars and marks in the seams and creases that just looks like crap and especially if you break something and it's under warranty you can't return it because if they look at it and go well you know it looks like you wedged a butter knife under this thing and pried it apart when the screws are blatantly you know visible right there no we can't take it back so you take your camera apart you remove the, the infrared um, you know filter you go and make an infrared lamp out of infrared LEDs and some batteries get yourself a screen of some sort it could be either a CRT LCD Game Boy Advance hell even if you got one of them uh, I think it was a Sega Nomad I think it was called where it actually had a TV tuner yeah you might be able to mod that to be a screen who knows there's a whole bunch of solutions you can use wire it together with some batteries it's pretty simple keeping in mind that really do not plug your power source into your video input line you will blow out your screen that actually happened to this this screen at one point um, when my friend decided to pretend he knew what he was doing and wire one of my video receivers into it backwards so not only did he wire the power into the um, the video input he wired it backwards into the video input and no joke when I say this screen got nuked smoke was bellowing out of it so really it's it's not that hard as for screens though I plan on doing a couple more projects that do involve screens so if you want to go and invest in one um, this cartridge cost me about twenty five dollars the CRT I have on the floor cost about twenty five dollars uh, however, the CRT on the floor has better quality than the Game Boy. The LCD um, on sale was about $50, but you can get them on eBay uh, for about $30, $35. Um, you can get them broken for about $15, and those things are damn near indestructible. I, It's been nuked, it's been dropped, it's been fried, it's been shorted, it's been blown out. Voltage and amperage has been jacked up way too high. I can't break that screen. I love it. I wish I could get another one. Um, and the... VR glasses, I think they cost me $125 after rebates, discontinued, so don't ask me where I got them, because they were clearance. They were really walked in, got them, said, that's it, <laughs> last pair. Um, yeah, I'll put some show notes up. Uh, you know, if you've got any questions on how to wire this stuff up, I mean, it's really simple. You know, tie your positive leads together, tie your negative leads together, you know, wire your, sig your, your camera's signal into to a screen, you're pretty much done. I mean... I'm making it sound a whole lot harder than it really is, so if you have any questions or comments, uh, hit the forums, hit the show notes, uh, contact me on, uh, on IRC if need be, I'll help you out, and uh, you know what, have fun, good luck, don't blow anything up, will you? In this segment, we're going to show you um, physical hacking, um, physical hacking through something called parkour, if you're in Europe, or urban free flow here in the United States. Um, hacking essentially is the exploration, understanding, and improvement of a system, right? Exactly. So, why can't you explore your system of physical movements, improve them so you have an advantage in your environment to either chase or when you are being chased? I mean, there's also like, you know, you've done martial arts, right? You know, and in martial arts, it's one system of, of fighting style versus another. It's not to use your body in the same way to your opponent. Yeah. yeah. Um, this segment, I mean, we're gonna we're gonna cover the basic introduction of like how the body moves and the science behind it, and some of the technique. Now, my style is different between Kiros and Kiros is you know different from HDD here. You have to develop your own style. You can't expect on day one you're gonna start doing 25 foot jumps and start running across walls and all this crazy stuff. You have to understand that we've been doing this for quite some time. We understand our limits, we understand our boundaries, and we do not exceed them. Um, if you're going to do this to show off, you're going to get hurt. And if you're going to get hurt, please record it and send it to us so we can laugh at you. Horribly. Oh yeah. I mean, we've all we've all been through the, the typical injuries of any kind of um, sport. 
sprain ankle, sprain wrist. You know, sore muscles, you know, blood pressure shooting through the roof. All right, enough bitching and complaining, enough yammering on. Let's get to some uh, tutorial. Landing is one of the most important things to learn. If you don't know how to land properly, you will get hurt quite often. The spine was designed to expand and compress so that it can absorb shocks from dropping and walking. As you can see, as we fall, our arms are raised, keeping our spine expanded. As we hit the ground, we bend the knees, curve the spine, and then slap the ground. What we're doing is dispersing the energy evenly with our legs, back, and then our arms. You can use your environment to manipulate the amount of momentum and inertia that you will have. Swinging from this position, you will cause less momentum and therefore less impact energy rather than a straight drop. If you have too much forward momentum, you will have to learn how to transfer the energy properly. The easiest, easiest method is to roll. You never want to roll directly on your shoulder bone or across your spine. Um, what you want to do is you want to roll across the meat of your back. You need to lean slightly forward and to one side, tuck and roll across your back. If you notice how Kiros lands slightly off-center to help him line up for a proper roll. I don't roll unless I have to. I've learned how to transfer my momentum using uh, quadriplegial movement, which we won't get into today. long jumps. Remember that the spine absorbs energy. That's its job, that's what it does. When you jump, your spine will want to absorb that energy of you jumping upward. By crouching down and dropping your shoulders, you already compress your spine so it can't absorb energy. You are adding energy to your jump by pre-compressing it. Take a few steps forward to get your momentum going, lean slightly, and then start, uh, start to raise your, your, your back and, and arms, raising your shoulders. You need to get the timing right. What you're doing is coiling up like a spring and then releasing the built up energy from, from your legs, spine, and shoulders to gain height and distance. On landing, you want to do the opposite. You want to land in a similar position that you have started in. That way, the excess momentum and position of your arms and legs also help with your distance. You can use your arms to position your landing and to expand your spine. By raising your arms with the arc of your jump, you can expand your spine. That way, that it flows with the movement instead of compressing and absorbing the energy, like I said. When you land, you want to land with your feet in front of you so that you can start to absorb or transfer energy. If you land with your legs too far forward, you'll spring backwards. If they're too far backwards, you'll land on your face. Find a safe place to learn how to jump gaps, like a small play bridge at the park that we're at or even if you just have two markers on the ground jumping from point to point. Notice how we scrunch down right before the jump and then expand our body mid-flight at the peak of the jump. This is the proper way to jump. As we come back down, we align the spine by lowering the arms and pulling our knees up. This also gives us a little bit more travel time for distance. Vaulting. Vaults are defined as jumping or leaping over an obstacle with the aid of your arms. Now this is very useful in an urban environment, especially one with a lot of gates. There are many styles of vaulting. The most common are lazy vaults and monkey vaults. A monkey vault is when you approach a gate, grab it, jump up and over it, passing your legs through your arms. This doesn't take a great deal of strength on lower gates, but on larger ones, it does. Your average computer geek won't have the upper body to do a successful monkey vault. The most common injury I've seen with, uh, with monkey vaults is face plants. Oftentimes, people, people will catch the tips of their toes on the top of the obstacle, and they will head face first straight into the ground.
lazy vaults. Most of my vaults are, are lazy vaults, just because they're easier. As you approach your obstacle, place one hand down and then jump. Using that one hand as a guide, arch over and around. You can use a scissor kick style or a varial style. Now I use scissor kick and varial, you know, just very loosely, they're not official terms. The scissor kick style is, has one leg leading the other. The varial style has both feet placed together. If you need, you can use your other arm to guide your landing and control it. Or, you can do like HDD does, and you can do uh, like a 180 rotation and push off with one arm for a little bit more distance and oomph. A gate vault is not easy and is high risk, but it's very useful. Using your stomach to lean over a gate, use one arm to grab the top of the fence, your other arm to grab the lower part. Using your momentum of rotation over the fence, use your arms to guide yourself down into a landing. Wall kicks are useful for getting yourself over small obstacles and onto ledges that are normally out of your reach. As you approach a wall, jump into it and land with one foot on it, and try to bend your knee at a 90 degree angle, no more, then kick off in the direction you want to go into. You can kick up and backwards at a 45 degree angle to gain height, or you can kick out and upward to gain distance. We need to land in frame so this doesn't seem all too impressive. Your shoulders and hips will always oil align, so when you kick off, aim in the direction you want to land using your shoulders, your hips will follow. Wall runs are very useful. They can get you places that you can normally not reach. I would highly suggest trying to master them. What goes up must come down. Notice how we land. We walk to the edge and take one step off, extending the spine and arms while we drop, then landing in the exact same way I explained earlier. Wall runs are very difficult to master, but have to be the second most useful skill that you can learn, vaulting being the first. As you approach a wall, you will need, you will need speed, and lots of it. Jump into the wall, same as a wall run. But instead of kicking off, you need to kick upward. As you start to kick, lean forward with the angle of the wall if there is one. As you start to travel upwards, look for a spot to grab onto above you so you can use your arms to keep you on the wall. If it is possible, do a second and third step to gain even more height. If you can't master wall kicks, I wouldn't suggest wall runs. A lot of this is very similar to parkour, urban ninja, and urban free flow. I would highly suggest googling all of those terms. But before this ends, I feel that I don't do parkour, because parkour ensues a type of philosophy that I don't agree, so I can't say I do parkour because I don't agree with the philosophy, but it's all good. All of this is just exploring a system of physical movements, improving them to your advantage. You either one day might need to haul ass, or need to escape. Either way, you'd rather have them and not need them, than need them and not have them. You might be asking yourself, What's the real benefit from this? So here's a video clip of uh, me getting someplace that I shouldn't have been using these skills.
store. Come on. Yeah. Spring PCS Network Operations Control Center. Cell Site 27. Yeah, the rest of this, you're not gonna get to watch.